I'm Tim Constantine, and from Jonesport, Maine, this is the Capitol Hill Show. Everyone wants clean water. Everybody wants clean air. And we all want a healthy environment. Where the catch comes is how and who gets to define those things. The government has no shortage of regulations intended to protect the environment. But how much is too much? Every time there is a new rule or regulation, does it put people out of work? Does it harm communities? And what are the benefits? Not merely the good intentions, but what are the actual benefits? In elementary school, most Americans learned Congress makes the laws. And the executive branch, the president, and the agencies that fall under him implement those laws. The Clean Air Act, however, charged the Environmental Protection Agency with establishing clean air standards. Clearly, that authority came with good intentions. The result, however, has been a non-elected group of government bureaucrats constantly altering the way people live. From creating rules that would force car makers to build and sell EVs, whether the customer wants them or not, to threatening to ban gas stoves, something that 40% of kitchens in American homes use, government sometimes goes too far. Air quality, water quality, wetlands, you name it. And it's not just the EPA, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Interior, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Marine Fisheries Services, to name just a few. They're all government agencies trying to tell you what you can and can't do. It's often a moving target. Whether talking about energy and fossil fuels, or farmers and fishermen, there's a government agency waiting to control them all. Sometimes the government has to step in to assure big business doesn't ignore health and safety in pursuit of profits. But sometimes an inexperienced bureaucrat may step out of line, intent on making his or her mark, often at the cost of small business or private property owners. How do we strike a reasonable balance with these giant government agencies? Andrew Wheeler, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Hill Show. Great to be with you. Government, by its very nature, sets the framework for how society lives. And people, by their very nature, have different opinions on what those guidelines should be. Does government ever go from time to time, even if they have the best of intentions, does government ever go too far? Oh, sure. There, there's examples of government going too far. Um, let, let's just look at the energy world for a second, where, where government over the last 30 years has made decisions of go back 40 years. Forget how old I am at this point. Going back 40, 50 years and the energy decisions our country has made and our, the federal government has made, such as um, in the 70s, not wanting natural gas to, to power homes, um, to to what it's done on the nuclear, a stop and start on the nuclear industry um, because of, of different concerns. Yes, government can certainly go too far. And I, I think our founding fathers realized that when they set up our, our nation and they, they wanted checks and balances and they wanted to make sure that government was kept in check by the public, by the people. You served as EPA administrator under President Trump. During his four years, the EPA, the government as a whole rolled back more than a hundred regulations, some of those with air, some of those with water, a variety of things. How did that process work? How did you determine, okay, maybe we need to, to reel this in a little bit? Well, you know, to be honest, I never really used the term rollback. Um, I, I prefer modernize, because, you know, there's a number of regulations that we looked at that were, were very old. Um, I, you know, I went forward with new regulations on lead and copper pipes. It was the first time that regulation had been modernized in over 30 years. So it's updating, it's taking into account new science, new technologies, and making sure that we aren't just piling regulation on top of regulation, but going back and taking a look at the older regulations to make sure that they make sense in today's world. Where does the authority for the EPA to either make new rules or 
modernize new rules. Where does that authority come from? And did you see instances where that authority was exceeded? Well, I would certainly like to say that we did not exceed our authority, but the previous administration under President Obama exceeded their authority, and they lost a couple of high-profile cases with the Supreme Court where the EPA under their watch um, went too far. Um, and now I, I was accused as EPA administrator of rolling back the so-called Clean Power Plan, the, the Biden, the, I'm sorry, the Obama regulation for the, for the utility sector. But that regulation was stayed by the Supreme Court. So when we got there, we looked at it and said, this, obviously the Supreme Court is, is going to stay regulation, which is unprecedented. It means that the agency probably went too far. So we took a hard look at the law and we proposed a new regulation, the ACE rule, the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, that, um, in, in my opinion, followed the Clean Air Act. Now, the Clean Power Plan eventually, under the Biden administration, made its way to the Supreme Court, and you had the West Virginia versus EPA decision last year that struck down the, the Obama um, re regulation. And the rationale in that decision by the Supreme Court pretty much aligned with what we did in our regulation that the Biden administration withdrew. So I, I think we had it right. I think we had it right on the, the Clean Air Act, and I think we had it right on the waters of the United States, the, the wetlands rule, um, where the Obama administration went too far, and then we proposed something that followed, what I believe followed the law and followed Supreme Court precedent, and the Supreme Court rolled back the, the Obama-Biden um, approach. So I, you know, I, certainly the agency has gone too far, um, in terms of being rolled back by the Supreme Court or being, um, uh, being called out by the Supreme Court for extending their authority. Um, and there's, there's a lot of debate going on right now and at the, with, the, with the courts and the administrative state as far as how much deference should be given to the agencies. And there's a big case that's currently pending before the Supreme Court on that. When Wheeler's EPA cut certain regulations, they were accused of not caring about the environment. Wheeler says otherwise. Um, under our watch, every single environmental indicator improved. Air pollution went down, CO2 emissions went down, water quality went up. We cleaned up twice as many Superfund sites as the Obama administration did. Um, we, we made improvements across the board on protecting wildlife, protecting the air, protecting water, and protecting the American public's health. Wheeler recognizes that sometimes government mandates can clash with economic reality. During the Obama administration, they mandated specific engines for the lobster um, fishermen, and engines that were actually not available for those size of ships. And I, I worked with Senator, um, Senator Susan Collins from Maine, and I went up there and I met with the lobster fishermen, and we changed that regulation. We gave them more time so that the industry could develop the engines for their boats. But um, the, the Obama administration just said, okay, you have to have this engine. And the engine wasn't, wasn't even available. So you have to take practicality into account. Um, we had to spend quite a bit of time undoing that uh, because it was unworkable. It just was, the technology wasn't there. And I really credit um, Susan Collins from Maine bringing that to my attention when I was EPA Administrator. Lobster fishing provides nearly a billion dollar boost to the economy of the state of Maine. It's hard work, and government regulations make it even harder. Guidelines on engines, on ropes, on licensing, and on more all chip away at the already tight margins of these small businesses. And it's not just economics. Lobster fishing is part of the identity of the state. There's a respect and great pride in being part of this challenging work. Maine's lobster fishing industry provides nearly 90% of all lobster consumed in the United States. Virtually every lobster boat in Maine is family owned and operated, not controlled by some giant corporation. Well, we're all generational lobster fishermen. I'm third generation on my grandfather's side. I think it goes back further than that on my grandmother's side. Um, my father was a lobster fisherman, obviously, his father, and uh, the way it goes down the line, I have two sons, they'd be fourth if, if they choose to do it. The industry is a family thing. As a young boy, you know, you, you go on the boat with your father, because that's what you do around here in the summertime. You know, you're out of school and on the weekends and whatnot. And 
Um, like probably most everybody here, I was long as soon as I could stand up, put boots on. I was aboard the boat with my father, baiting pockets, uh, you know, doing whatever I could. Most of the time, probably playing with fish that come out of the traps or you know something like that. But just being aboard the boat and uh, you know being being with my father was was really special. It's what everybody does around here. I mean, that's what makes these two towns go. It's what makes this whole entire coast of Maine go. But this old, old industry is being constantly threatened in the 21st century, not by locals, but by national environmental groups. It's all NGO companies um, that, that are pushing all this stuff, um, suing the national government um, to do with whales. They basically want to industrialize the, the Gulf of Maine with, with windmills and to do that, they need to get rid of us, lobster fishermen, and all, all fishermen in, in general. Um, they've already done that to the, to the fish draggers, and now they're coming after us. And, and we're the low-hanging fruit. You know, we're all individual companies. Like, he owns his own boat. He owns, you know, we all own our own boats. Though they are small businesses, however, they have started to fight back. The Maine Lobstermen's Association actually did that. Um, with the, the national, with the National Marine Fisheries Service, we sued them um, for all the uh, rules and regulations that they were putting on us. The justification for many of the regulations being pushed on the lobster industry is supposed to be to save the right whales. There is, however, one small problem with that logic. How long have you been lobster fishing? Uh, 25, 30 years. How long? 30 years. So 35 long as I can years. Remember, yeah. All different, your life. Different, different, yeah. 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 And, but 30, in that time frame, 36, 37. you know, we tally, tally that up, it's over 100 years between the four of you. Right. How many right whales have you seen? I got half of that myself. How many right whales have you seen? Zero. I've held, you, I've you, held a license for 50 years. I, I could give you a million dollars. Yeah, I was thinking I got 40. I could buy all the fuel you wanted to burn in a boat, and I guarantee you couldn't find a right whale in if they would 50, 50 miles from. from Short of 50 miles out, you couldn't find the right whale. I'll bet on it. These are not just folks trying to get one past the government. They have a long track record of playing by the rules and addressing problems in their industry. As fishermen, we have nothing against whales. We don't, we don't want to see any harm come to the whales. And like, like Sonny said, I mean, we, I've seen humpbacks. I've been off that tuna fishing. I've seen humpbacks breaching and going around. Oh, absolutely. We, we fish mono. And I've had humpbacks and finbacks come right by the boat. They never get entangled up in it. I mean, you know, the it thing, just... The thing about it, if there was a problem, we'd be the first ones to address it. It's just like the way that the, the V-notch started. Fishermen saw a problem with guys taking egg-bearing females and keeping them. So the fishermen themselves came up with this V-notch law. The fishermen themselves came up with the measure law the oversized measure law, the undersized measure law, the fishermen themselves would take care of it. If we had a problem with entangling whales all the time, we would figure out a way to fix it. That's They've done their homework too. Dolphins. It's not just whales, you no. know, down, down off uh, New Jersey and stuff, where they're doing seismic testing for windmills, trying to figure out where's the best spot to put them. And you're having whales and seals and, and dolphins and all kinds of things drifting up on shore. And these are just the ones that are drifting up on shore. And they do necropsies on them, which is basically an autopsy for, for a mammal. And they basically kind of look at it, is it, is it entangled? Or is it, does it have uh, uh, blunt force trauma? Or does it have propeller marks down its back? But what they don't do is they don't do a necropsy on the inner eardrum, which is when they do the seismic testing, it ruptures their inner eardrum and they lose their equilibrium, lose the balance, and they don't know where they are, and then they end up somewhere beached. struck by a ship or beached or whatnot. Yep. Yep. And that's but they the won't do way. that because the government's the one that does the necropsies. Like with me, um, I fish offshore outside three miles in federal waters. Um, and 20 years ago, we had to change from having floating rope in between our traps. Our traps are connected with ropes in between them. And we had to change from using floating rope to using sinking rope that would lay on the bottom of the ocean. So they, um, they said that the whales were diving down and getting caught in the floating rope. And, and you know, so, so they- So put, you made the change. So we made the change. It cost a lot of money to do it. And we've lost a lot of gear since then. 
um, because of the rope laying on bottom and chafing and you know you lose you lose traps so but I mean everything that the government has asked us to do we've done but still some want more from the lobster fishermen each of them to a man is worried that this industry could be killed if if the lobster fishing industry goes away there's a hundred little towns on the coast of Maine just like us. And it's not just a coast. And they're all and they're all gonna be gone. And you know, they'll still be there, but they'll be filled with beautiful houses out on the edge of the water, and they're gonna have beautiful wind farms to look at. And that's what it will be. Maine lobster fishermen aren't alone. Another version of the same story, government regulations threatening their livelihood, rings true for cattle farmers, coal miners, and factory workers all over America. Somehow, in their zest to meet a seemingly arbitrary standard, the government sometimes forgets the impact on hardworking Americans like the lobster fishermen. Jason Isaac, half a continent away in Texas, he is the CEO of the American Energy Institute. He worries that what the lobster fishermen are suffering is not unique to their industry. Then they go too far by proposing rules that they say the Clean Air Act, which is a, a big piece of legislation of the EPA, they go too far by proposing rules that go beyond anything that improves public health or the environment. And in some cases, it actually makes the environment worse. I, I say that a lot of these bureaucrats and the climate alarmists are destroying the earth to save the planet. And th these are some of the policies that they're pushing, the result of some of the policies you mentioned air quality. Yes. And, and you know, the, the dirty word, no pun intended, is air pollution. And nobody wants air pollution. I don't want air pollution. You don't want air pollution. But the question is, how do we define pollution? The EPA, you mentioned, has just put forth yet another air quality proposal, a rule that they're trying to push. What is that rule? Explain what it is, and is it good, is it bad? Sure, I served in the Texas House of Representatives, and I served on the Environmental Regulation Committee, and was very involved with, with our EPA, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and know that our country has more air quality monitors around the United States than any other country. And we measure our air quality, and there are six criteria pollutants that we tracked. When I left the legislature and I started with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, I was visiting with a senior staffer for a U.S. senator, served on the Energy Committee, and I said, I'd love to come by and visit with you and talk to you about how we're world leaders in clean air and how we've reduced pollution at this time 73% in nearly five decades. And he laughed in my face. Today, we're at nearly an 80% reduction of the six criteria pollutants that in certain cases, in certain concentrations, impact human health. We are well beyond any measure of that. We've gone so far at improving our air quality. Well, we use the phrase overreach, and that can be applied a couple of different ways. Is it an overreach of logic? because it doesn't actually improve? Or is it an overreach of their actual authority? Is the EPA limited at some point as to what they can reasonably do? I, and I think so, and I think the Supreme Court may get a case on this soon, hopefully, and they'll rule on it accordingly. But they have gone so far as to consider things like CO2 pollution. And, the, and you hear the administration talk about carbon pollution which is hilarious. I laugh at that. It's not one of the six criteria pollutants that the EPA is administered to track. Uh, CO2 is something that's necessary for life on Earth. There are multiple reports just over the last few years that talk about how our planet is actually greening as we increase CO2 emissions. You would think that the green movement would be for a green Earth, but it's still, it's 0.04% of our atmosphere. So this is overreach. I believe it's beyond their regulatory authority an energy transition that's completely needless. In the energy transition, there's a big push for solar and for wind. Nothing wrong with either one of them, but they don't necessarily supply a stable, uh, dependable product at the other end. Are we lowering the bar in the United States by saying we want a less stable grid, a less reliable source of power whether that's for our homes, our businesses, our cars, whatever it is. 
What it is, you have people that are making policies that just don't understand how a grid actually works. They're not listening to the engineers and the people that actually run grids. And they're allowing a parasite to the grid to become more prevalent. And then they're dumping hundreds of billions of dollars so that parasite continues to grow. And that parasite is wind and solar. It doesn't have a reliability factor. It, it, it's available when the weather cooperates, and that's something we can't predict a couple of weeks out, but we know demand out a couple of years. This is something that Germany has experienced firsthand. They're now removing wind turbines to get to the coal underneath because they realize they need reliable electricity. And reliable electricity comes from natural gas, it comes from coal and it comes from nuclear, and quite a, you need all three of them. Coal is phenomenal at on-site storage. You could keep nine months of energy supply on-site at a, at a coal-fired power plant. That may not be the case with natural gas. And nuclear is not going to ramp up and down like you can with coal and natural gas, but you need all three and you need more of them. Germany is experiencing deindustrialization. The largest BMW manufacturing facility is in South Carolina. I think that's an embarrassment to the German people, quite honestly, but they've driven that production overseas because their electricity costs are as high as they are. What's the trade-off? Because I always talk in terms of, say, a policeman and a teacher, a young couple that's married, what they can afford and what they can't afford. And when we work with EVs, they're more expensive than traditional cars. When we drive up the cost of gasoline by limiting what we can or can't do uh, in the United States, that impacts not only every time you fill up your car, but every truck that is taking eggs and produce and meat to your store. So it makes it more and more difficult for that couple, for that young couple who's, who's trying to get by. What's the trade-off here? What is a fair assessment? Obviously, we want a clean world. We want a better world. But do we cripple an economy to do that? Are we crippling an economy doing that? Yeah, we are absolutely crippling an economy to do that. And the trade-off is there's higher cost and there's no benefit. We've already proven that we're world leaders in clean air. We've reduced pollution 78% over the last five decades. We're number one when it comes to access to clean and safe drinking water, something that 4 billion people on the planet don't get to experience because they don't have access to energy. And you talk about teachers and firefighters and police officers a lot of them don't realize that their pensions are being weaponized against responsible energy producers through the guise of ESG, this environmental, social, and governance. It's essentially Chinese social credit scoring for businesses that the companies like BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard and others are pushing and forcing these companies to comply with environmental standards that go against the best interests of their business. And we're finally, finally seeing some of these companies start to push back like Exxon, suing shareholders for continuing to push, re push resolutions that, that are contrary to the best interests of their shareholders, uh, which is phenomenal. It's nice to see some of these companies finally standing up and recognizing and admitting that they produce goods that we need and do it more responsibly than anywhere else on the planet. What seems to be uniform, no matter where Americans live or what they do for work, is a sense of frustration at the never-ending addition of more and more regulations. I almost feel bad sometimes when I put lobsters in a pot for crying out loud. <laughs> almost. Not almost. really. <laughs> almost. Not really. It tastes good. <laughs> oh, it's that good. I asked Mr. Wheeler how people can be sure that their voice is heard in Washington. The oil industry, for example, has lobbyists. Uh, the environmental community, different activist groups, have lobbyists. How does the average citizen who may be concerned about the environment, may be concerned about the world they're raising their children in, but does not have time to spend in the state capital or in the nation's capital, how are they assured that their voice is heard above the din that is created by the lobbyists from either extreme? You know, when, when I um, when I talk to school groups and, I, and if I talk to them about how Washington DC works in lobbyists, I always ask them, are you represented by a lobbyist? And everybody keeps their hands down, but I start rolling off things like if you work for a fast food restaurant, you are represented by a lobbyist. Everybody, every interest in our country is represented in some way by some lobbyist in DC. But I really think the more important thing for society and what parents should do is pay attention to what their children are being taught and to make sure that they have a well-rounded education and they aren't just buying um, what, what the media might be what might be giving them and that they and that they you should always look at your source of information you should look w where the information is coming from 
whether or not they're, they're biased or unbiased, and then make decisions and make sure that your children are educated and make sure that they're learning about capitalist society, free markets. We have the best country in the world. Um, we set the standards, not just on environmental standards, but on every, every aspect. And I, it's just, it, it sickens me to see so many young people today think that we, are, we live in a horrible regime, that, that they don't, in, in the protesting that they do, where if they try to do that in any other number of countries, they would be thrown in jail. They would be thrown off buildings. It's, it's, we, we don't have, our young people today don't have an appreciation for democracy here in the United States and what it means. And we're always just a few years away from that and it, from ending it. And we've, we've got to make sure. And as we come up with the, the America's 250th birthday celebration, we need to make sure that all young people are taught about the importance of our country and our system of government. Andrew Wheeler, thank you, my friend. Thank you.